Hi, hi, Courtney. Hi. Um, I want to start just by saying a few things um, just to get us all situated. You finished Yale in 1968 and you moved to New York. Yes. Okay. And you immediately moved downtown into what we now know of as Soho. Yes. Right. Okay. And you were painting um, large scale abstract works. Yes. Okay. Um, I want everyone just to, just to have a That's sense of right. what, you know, who you are, what's happening. Um, what was painting like at that moment? What's painting like just before 1970? Uh, a big rift between representational art mm -hmm. and abstraction. Abstraction was pretty much the norm in terms of what was going on in most of the galleries. The minimalist period was at its high point. Um, Does that mean then that there were more painters than sculptors, or more sculptors than painters? How was, what there were more painters. Was? There were more painters than than uh, sculptors, and certainly more painters than uh, performance people and things of of that nature. Um, there was a generation of painters, the abstract expressionists. They were, most of them were in their 90s at that point, the ones that were alive. And the second generation. I think that, I, I think that, um, that Bill's microphone is not. Can I, maybe we just move it up a little bit because it seems to be going in and out. Thank you. How is that? No. Still going it's in not, and out? No, it's not. It's, I. I'll talk louder. Uh, there was a second generation of, of uh, painters, uh, like Al Hell and Alex Katz, and that generation was pretty much holding forward in terms of the gallery scene. And certainly pop art was at its high point at that point. There were fewer galleries uh, in New York than there are now, and most of the galleries at that point uh, were uptown. And then they gradually moved downtown. Where's uptown? Where, where uptown would, would have been downtown. in the 50s. Okay and up to the 70s. Uh, there were only two galleries in Soho when I moved there. Uh, one was uh, Paula Cooper. Paula Cooper was on Green Street. And then a gallery opened called Reese Paley. Uh, Reese Paley moved in on um, Prince Street as well. And they were across the street from each other. And that, <clears throat> about a year later, Ivan Karp moved in. And then there was a procession of painter, of uh, galleries thereafter. What was in Soho at that point were lots and lots of artists throughout the loft area. And that was a precarious kind of living because it wasn't legal at that point. And you had to do all kinds of things, one, to get into, your, into the loft and then to sub, uh, sustain yourself there. And that was pretty much the environment in New York when I um, got out of graduate school and moved to New York. So it wasn't legal because you were living and working in what was formerly industrial spaces. That, yes. that was the illegality. That, well, it was that, but also the, um, it wasn't designed for, um, for, for a living. So there were code violations in terms of electric, plumbing, et cetera, that one had to deal with. It sounds like in the way that you described this that you were in exactly the right place at the right time to be making the kind of art that you made. I was. I was. I moved into a building that had uh, Joe Shapiro was on uh, a floor above me. Ken Nolan was on a floor below me. Um, there was an older artist named Copley that was on the top floor. There was a photographer, a uh, fashion photographer named I think it was Solano that was on a floor in the building. Uh, Janet Fish was in the building next door. And then there was a procession of uh, musicians that were within. Art Blakely was across the street. There was a wonderful uh, saxophone player named Sam Rivers who was around the corner. So it was lively in terms of the artists that were on that block uh, and around the other blocks. Uh, Rauschenberg Studio is around the corner. Um, I can go on the number of artists that were, were, were there. So as a young person, it was terrific for me coming. And there were lots of painters 
that were there that were older. Some I knew from earlier encounters with them. But for me, it was the perfect environment. Can you tell us, you mentioned that there were two galleries, Paula Cooper, who um, you know, has gone on to have an illustrious career as a, as a dealer, and then also Reese Paley. You showed with Reese Paley. I did show with okay. Reese Paley. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that exhibition? Uh, actually, the drawings, the works on paper that are here at Michael Rosenfeld's are come out of that period, the period of 1970, 1969, I should say 1968 through 1970. All the works are from 1970. And the works that are in the show had been rolled up for 49 years. And it's only in the last, um, I guess, about five years ago that we found those in the studio as we were transferring the studio to a different location. Um, when you say found, do you mean that you'd, you'd forgotten that they existed? I forgot they existed. They were rolled up. Oh, thank you. They were rolled up and put away in a storage area that I have in the studio. Can you still hear me, or still it's not? Well, I just have to talk <laughs> even louder then. But uh, they were just recently found. No, I think you think you need to use it. It's on now. Okay. They were just recently found. And the, the, the nice thing about them is that they are as vibrant now as they were when I made them. And because they were rolled up, they were pretty much protected in terms of uh, the condition of them. And I owe that to my son, of having found them as we were cleaning and organizing the studio. Uh, but the first show that I did with Reese Paley, and I'll give you a, a kind of incident. Reese, I was in Ivan Karp's space, and Ivan Karp's space was actually Costelli's space up time, uptown, because Ivan Karp worked for Costelli. And this gentleman came into the gallery and said, I'm looking for this artist named William T. Williams. And Ivan Karp literally said, well, that's him over there. And uh, it was a person named Reese Paley. And he came up and he said, I saw one of your paintings reproduced in the New York Times, and I want to represent you in open, opening a gallery. And uh, that's how it came about. He opened the gallery, had a terrific group of artists, uh, John Walker, Ona Oko, myself, um, Richard Von Slagle, uh, Nancy Graves, uh, a terrific group of artists that were in the gallery. And uh, I would, did the third show of, of uh, Reese Paley. And what were the works in the show? The works in the show were geometric paintings, all that I had done from 1968 through uh, 1970. Uh, they were my interest in geometry, my interest in abstraction, and they were large scale. They were like nine feet by seven feet, and s one was seven feet by 33 feet. Wow. Um, I wanted to make them large. I wanted to make them bold. I wanted you not to be able to walk away from the painting without having formed an opinion. And I wanted them to uh, announce that I was going to compete with every painter that ever painted a painting. And that was my intent. And um, I read, um, I've never heard you say this, but I read this, that you said that they were aggressive and that you were making an aggressive statement with them. What does that mean in, in terms of painting? Well, if we think of the period, 19, that late 60s, early 70s, we were involved in... Uh, Vietnam, were involved in the civil rights movement. Um, I wanted to make, within abstraction, using abstraction, I wanted to make paintings that were confrontational, uh, one in physical scale, but also in terms of kind of compositional issues that existed within the paintings. Uh, the paintings were, uh, the, the, the forms always were contained within the rectangle but they were aggressive forms in terms of the kind of organizational structure. Hmm. It, does that aggression also extend to the colors interaction with the forms and shapes? Uh, the color, I was very interested in dissident uh, rather than harmony, and I was very interested in the idea of uh, uh, the opposite of what the minimalist movement was. Uh, I wanted paintings that, that were reflective of the exterior world, something that was outside of my studio.
but I wanted the language to be the language of abstraction. I wasn't interested in representation. I wasn't interested in the idea of uh, uh, avert protest. I wanted whatever existed in the paintings to uh, began to happen very slowly. There was a, over a long period of release of, of uh, a lot of that. The color itself was probably the, the, it, the most immediate vehicle that one would see in terms of the dissidence, the use of dissidence as opposed to harmony. You're also, um, at that moment, involved in a conversation. It's not just the conversation between representation and abstraction, but there's also oil painting versus acrylic. And does your, is there a sense for you that the use and wide availability of, of acrylics by the early 70s, does that open up something else for you in terms of color? Oh, it did. Um, what did open up? I, I had been fortunate enough to meet uh, Lenny Bokur, and Bokur was the main uh, supplier and manufacturer of acrylic at that point, and probably was my first patron um, he was instrumental in terms of not only supplying materials to me for 15 years, but also uh, supplying technical information. If I had a technical problem or if I wanted something I had in my head that I wanted to do that I couldn't figure out, sometimes he would suggest uh, materials. And if I really ran into a technical, he would say, well, come on up to the factory and we'll work it out. And that relationship lasted for 15 years and uh, was instrumental in terms of being able to compete and make paintings of the scale that I was making them. And I'm forever grateful for that, that relationship over that 15-year period. Presumably, some of those conversations that he had with you also fed back into his process as well and then went on to the market. So other painters got to benefit from you know, a problem that you were trying to solve <laughs> in your own painting practice that then gets filtered out into the kinds of paint that's being made, you know, the way the colors are actually uh, being produced and then, and then sold. Well, certainly there was a dialogue going yeah. on and... Um, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you... Um, so you're into 70. Tell us about the work that's on view here in, um, in Freeze. Is there, what are these? Because these are actually works on paper. Um, do they have a relationship with the paintings that are made at the same time? Are they kind of companion pieces? What are they? Uh, the way I work is the paintings, the large scale paintings on canvas are done directly. There are no pre-drawings for them. And I don't do a little thing, then blow it up. I composed directly on the canvas. Uh, the drawings very often are, were and are. Uh, I would look at the painting and think, gee, there was another uh, relationship I could have created in that painting. And it would alter the structure or alter the way one entered the painting. And I would do it. Uh, I would kind of just freehand draw them on um, large pieces of arches and do them very quickly. Well, what was occurring, and to I wasn't really aware of, is they were really suggesting where the paintings were going to go. Uh, the surfaces were becoming much more expressionistic. There was a greater degree of involvement with the paint itself, the physicality of the paint, and also the, the, the tactile. And that leads to the next shimmering series, where you be really began to see that the emphasis on touch, the emphasis on brushwork, becomes more paramount. Mm -hmm. And are they are all roughly the same size? Uh, all the paintings during that period were either five by seven, seven by seven, or nine by seven. Okay, and then what happens then with the works on paper? Are they the also? The works on paper are proportioned to those. Uh, most of them are, are, are uh, I think those are about 48 or 50 inches by 50 inches. Uh -huh. But the drawings are always proportionate to the, the five by seven format. And the five by seven format was the description of how far I could reach to the sides, and how far when I was standing I could uh, comfortably meet, reach to the top. And that was the way those proportions came about. What that did was give me a body relationship, so that became content. 
I realized that that was very much in relation to my own body, and that made it much easier to work. Wow. Did that did that shift in time at all? That in, the the ability to sort of use your body as the measure for the work. It did. I, I started. Uh, making some elongated paintings, some of them during that period, 12 inches wide and seven feet high, and just trying to think about the format and how the format, just the physical format, influenced content. Hmm. So just to think about 1970 a little bit, do you, did the conversation around painting begin to change from that period forward? Do you think that when you came to New York and you're enmeshed in this conversation, that seems to be one that's moving or sort of vacillating between representation and abstraction and where you know, many painters have moved towards uh, the Lower West Side of the city. Um, is there then a kind of generative conversation around painting and where did you, where did you feel like you fell into it? Um, I wasn't interested in, in uh, minimalism. Okay. What I was interested in was a kind of uh, clear, rational thinking the painters that I like had, there was a, um, um, a clarity to what they were doing. They weren't, they weren't working out of emotion. They were working out of a, a clear kind of uh, decif decisive idea of what painting could be about. Who did you like? Uh, which painters did I like mm -hmm. a great deal? Um, <laughs> that's not fair. Oh, no. No, no. I can't. If I they're can't. not alive, you can say it. Uh, <laughs> I, Mike, I won't do okay. that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> uh, I'll pass on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> when you say though that they're not working out of emotion and they have a clarity, is that a clarity that you can see on the canvas, or is that clarity in terms of the way that they approach composition in general? And how did how did you know? Where did you spot the clarity? Um, I never liked um, sword fighting in paintings. Okay. And what I mean by sword fighting is a lot of brushwork where you're kind of expressionistically all over the place mm -hmm. and you're kind of waiting for something to happen. Um, I like to go into the studio and have a clear idea of what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, I get lost into the process of the paint the physicality of the stuff, the sensuous nature of it. Um, and at that moment, I forget about what I'm doing when, I'm, when that sensuous moment comes. Mm -hmm. And I'm into what I think at that point is just pure painting. Uh, where the painting goes is, is, is up to the painting, not up to me in terms of that, that process. How long did it take for you to complete one of the large scale works on canvas versus the period of time for the works on paper? The works on paper, most of those were probably done in two days. Okay. Whereas the painting, some of those are taking um, two, three weeks. Okay. And at that point, I'm working with a assistant in the studio, which kind of made the process a little easier. Um, the paintings that I'm doing now, some of them I work on a year, two years. There are some that I've been working on for four or five years. So the process now is slowed down a great deal. I'm far more involved in, in the idea of um, uh, going into the studio and then allowing myself to think about nuances in paintings. Uh, it may be something I did five years ago that I see a, a better way of doing it. And I go back and, and rethink it, rework it. In the early 70s, when I was doing those paintings, uh, there was an urgency, mm -hmm. both in my life and in terms of what I thought art was about and should be about. And a great deal of the working process had to do with the amount of time that I had to work. Um, I worked in a studio where there was no windows. The windows were boarded up uh, on purpose so that the conditions in the studio would always be consistent. I didn't want natural light to come in and have to deal with that. So all of the windows in the loft were, in the studio part of the loft, were boarded up or closed down. And that was really helpful to me. But what I began to realize is that part of what I was painting about had to do with the natural world. 
uh, those nuances of light changing, et cetera, that I was making all of that up in my head in terms of what I was doing with color. Uh, it's only later that I began to realize that um, there were other kinds of things that I was evolving into. But having the studio self-contained like that was really very helpful. Yeah. I think we would, would you welcome questions from our audience? Absolutely. Oh, good news. Yes. Great. Hold on. Can you hold on for one second? A mic is coming towards you. In terms of how you see formalism, um, how do you think something like tape functions in terms of like the mental process of creating an image or a composition? Uh, something like tape or uh, sketching with a pencil first in terms of uh, comparison to like abstract expressionism that you would call sword fighting or something that is more gestural? Well, tape is absolute in that it has the same degree of absoluteness as geometry. Um, it's a shortening process in terms of doing something. Um, it's just another material, another technique. Um, it was important, certainly important, during the late 60s for people that were involved in the minimalist period. Uh, some used it, some didn't, but the, the uh, uh, it might be interesting to see a show that titled Tape and deals with the issues of tape mm. because within the people who use tape, there is an extraordinarily difference in terms of the drawing, a an extraordinary difference in terms of edges, uh, how they came about painting two, two things coming together. Uh, very often when you see something, uh, you just see the image. You don't really think about how the paint is stopped and or how it's bleeding within to the canvas, what texture, what um, weave the canvas is. But the, all of those things became far more important or are important if you're using tape. Uh, my name is Robert. Um, I'm a neon artist. Um, I just want to ask what tips or advice you would give towards like new emerging artists. Uh, painting is an old man's game. <laughs> and I say that because uh, Romy Bearden said that to me probably the third week I was in New York. Mm. To slow down, take your time. The most important thing is to learn your craft. And then Follow your heart after you know your heart. Because the first instance is very often you, you, you want to communicate <laughs> kind of a lot of personal ideas. Yeah. But you have to weed through that personal stuff. Mm. Um, mainly take your time. I mean, that's, that's, that's the essential thing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about Romare Bearden. There was recently an exhibition of his abstractions, which come a little bit earlier. Um, but I'm wondering, and they're not like yours at all, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, maybe they're more like an artist, like Helen Frankenthaler, for example. But I was wondering if you knew those works, you know, what you thought about them, whether you talked with Bearden about them at all. I did know uh, Mr. Bearden. His studio was eight blocks from my studio. I never talked to him about um, his work. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I never talked to him about my work. What we talked about was North Carolina because we both were from North Carolina and we were adjoining counties within North Carolina. We talked about um, things of that nature. Uh, Rarely, rarely did we ever talk about his work or my work. Um, a lot of advice from him in terms of he was certainly had been doing it at that point for 50 or 60 years. And his advice always was, Bill, are you in the studio? And I would say yes. And he said, take your time, take your time, take your time. And that advice I've kind of stuck to over the years. Um, I had the ad advantage of going to 
starting art school when I was 14. And I went to high school on 54th Street and Lexington Avenue. So the modern was like six blocks away. And the modern was an extension of the classroom for, uh, for me, as what was the Met. So there was a lot of looking, and I kind of understood what he was saying in terms of taking your time. And looking at a lot of things when I decided, when I just said to you that I don't want to say which painters were important, it's because I've looked at so much painting in both of those institutions. And I go to museums, and I want to learn something from every painting that I look at. It's not a matter of me liking the painting, because I'm usually you know, 13 inches away from the painting. And I'm more interested in putting my head in, in where the painter is. What did he or she do? What's underneath? What's on top? Is it glazed over? What kind of brushes is the person using, et cetera? That's, when I go to the museum, that's what I do. The content is not, or the narrative is not that important to me. What's important is how they use that material, because that's what's going to help me in my own studio, is, is understanding all of that uh, stuff that they did. I Can I just so follow good. up quickly, um, very, very quickly? It's just amazing that to hear you describe your practice um, and your method, because to look at the work, it seems that it must have been laid out very, very carefully in advance in a drawing. But what you're saying, as I understand it, is that you really just started and went with the painting with certain ideas in your mind. Well, it's laid out in my head, because mm -hmm. I've been doing this now for 60 years. So it, it's not a question of having to have a score or having to have a, a, a sketch. Uh, it's going to be right, because it's mine. And the problem that you can have as a young artist is that you're always thinking about your work in relation to another artist's work. So that art, other artist becomes the, um, the goal you're after. And you have to stop drinking your wine from someone else's glass. Mm. That's the most essential thing as an artist. Oh. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's going to be right because it's mine, because it's yours. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bill, for coming and talking to us. Uh, oh, this wow. is wonderful. I think um, we will end here, but you, but Bill will be around for a few more minutes if people have additional questions. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you.